As the dawn breaks over the tranquil sea at Whitby, the fishing boats slip quietly back into harbour. When they do, they can sit in the warm early morning sun and sample the night's catch fresh from the quayside. Whilst fishing is still a major industry in the town, it's by no means the only one. There's a thriving commercial port, of which the steel sprinter is a frequent visitor. The Swing Bridge, one of many bridges on this site, was built in 1909 and has since undergone a major overhaul to improve its reliability, vital for the ships passing through to the port's commercial quay. To ease traffic congestion in the town's narrow streets, a new bridge was built further up the Esk in 1980, so bypassing much of the town for through traffic. There's also a large contingent of pleasure vessels using the harbour and many must feel comforted by the sight of the moored lifeboat as they put to sea. The lifeboats and crews are made of sturdy stuff. This old lifeboat, the Mary Ann Hepworth, was commissioned in 1938, and in her time as an active lifeboat she put to sea 372 times and is credited with saving 201 lives before her decommissioning in 1974. Still a sturdy craft, she now takes hundreds of Whitby's visitors on sea trips. All this activity taking place under the watchful eye of Captain Cook's Monument, perched high on the West Cliff. To one side of Cook's Monument is a set of whale jawbones, presented to Whitby in 1963 by Norwegian Thor Dahl. With the East Cliff, St Mary's Church and the Abbey as a backdrop, they present a wonderful photo opportunity for visitors. It's here in Grape Lane that Captain Cook's maritime career really started. This house, owned by his employer, Mr. James Walker, was where Cook first worked, lodged and learned his basic maritime skills. Now a museum, and officially opened in 1987 by Lord Lewin, Admiral of the Fleet. Covering three floors, the house has been restored to its former state, and the furniture on display is much the same as when Cook lived here. The museum attracts visitors, both young and old, from all over the world. The accompanying shop contains all manner of informative booklets, giving the history of Cook and his exploits, as well as pictures and diagrams of the local cat-built bark ships he used to such effect in his explorations. In the same lane is the Whitby Archives and Heritage Centre, which can supply a wealth of information about Whitby and its history. The Bagdale Old Hall, built around 1520 and thought to be haunted, was once the home of Shaw Jeffrey and is now a hotel with real character. Mounted in the wall is a Venetian sculpture depicting St George and the Dragon. Shaw Jeffrey, author of Whitby Lore and Legend, claims this to be the original with the replica in Mecieria Venice, but this is hotly contested. Shaw Jeffrey was a compulsive traveller, writer and artist. His book, Black and White South Africa, and these watercolours are records of his experiences in South Africa.
Still within sight of the Whitby Abbey, and almost concealed from view by surrounding hedges, is a beautiful hidden garden oasis of terraced flowerbeds and lawns known as Panet Park. Within its borders can be found the distinguished building of the Panet Art Gallery and Museum. The art gallery was originally built by Robert Panet to exhibit his collection of paintings by artist and friend George Wetherill. It was later extended to incorporate the town's museum, both of which remained open throughout the year. There are two permanent art exhibitions, the Staith's collection of fine art paintings from local Staith's artists, and the Wetherill Room with a superb collection of George Wetherill's paintings. A further gallery is also used to exhibit other artists' work throughout the year. The museum houses what can only be described as an amazing collection of geological specimens, second only to the National Collection in London, ranging from the large Saurians to the smaller Belemnites and Ammonites in the display cabinets, some of which are classed as type fossils not normally found on display. One of the crafts practiced in Whitby was the making of jewellery and objects of art from locally found jet. This magnificent jet chessboard is just one of many examples of jet craftsmanship to be found in the museum. Much sought after by the Victorians after Queen Victoria introduced it to her court. Some fine examples can be seen in the museum's exhibition cabinets. Many may well have been made in this very workshop. Uncovered behind a brick wall in Burns Yard during renovation work, it said the foreman's overall was found exactly as it's seen here today. The large wheel provided the motive power and was connected to the top small wheel by a leather strop. The thought of this working arrangement must strike horror into the hearts of today's health and safety inspectors. Such was the quality of the work, it was in demand all around the world. The workshop was moved from Burns Yard and can now be seen at the foot of the 199 steps in the Whitby Jet Museum. The craft of jewellery making has not died out completely in Whitby. Here in Silver Street, Anne and Keith Young frequently use jet when making fine jewellery in their workshop. What I could, um... yeah. In the same street as Botham's, this family firm of bakers have been making bread and confectionery in Whitby since it was first established in 1865. In Church Street, you could be forgiven for thinking you'd stepped back in time, with its cobbled streets and oldy worldy shop fronts, even the post office looks the part. The cobbles were relayed to allow period filming, and many of its yards and shops have featured in the popular Heartbeat series. There are a multitude of fascinating shops throughout Whitby. This art gallery in the Market Square is run by local artist Jen Freeman. Stepping into the Shepherd's Purse reinforces the feeling of going back in time, with rows of jams and preserves, racks of spice jars, barrels full of nuts, soap and candles, a shop as it might well have been in the late 19th century. At the back of the shop is a delightful courtyard where visitors can swap ideas and adventures over a cup of tea or coffee. There are of course many cafes in Whitby. This one boasts a balcony over the harbour, giving its customers a wonderful view. If you need something a little stronger than tea or coffee, the town does have the odd one or two pubs, well, around 20 to be more precise. The old town hall still dominates the market square. It was originally a toll gate with the stocks sighted in the arches below. There's been a market on this site for hundreds of years, 
and it still continues, although the produce has changed. Now you can buy a large variety of goods, from paintings and prints to candy floss and hot dogs. Although I don't think I can recommend the cosmetic surgery. At the very end of Henrietta Street, under the watchful eye of St. Mary's Church, is Fortune's Kipper House. They've been smoking herrings in these sheds since 1872. The herrings are filleted and hung on hangers, ready to be smoked over wood shavings. This imparts the very distinctive flavour. Once smoked, the kippers are taken into the shop for sale. They're also shipped around the world, often to people who visited Whitby in the past. Fresh fish and mussels can be bought in the local shops, many of which are owned by the fishermen themselves. It used to be possible to get onto the East Pier from the end of Henrietta Street, but due to cliff erosion this sadly is no longer possible. St Mary's Church and the Abbey can be reached via the 199 steps in Church Street. As the name suggests, there are 199 steps to be negotiated before you reach the top. But when you do, the views of the town and countryside are really worth the effort. Cademan's Cross was erected in 1898 to commemorate the life and works of Cademan, known as the first English poet, who died in 680. The building of St Mary's Church is thought to have started in 1110, with many additions and modifications throughout the centuries. It has a character and style that has to be seen to be appreciated. This church has so much history, it supported a program of its own, a copy of which can be purchased in the church. In 1612, the Chumleys, who were the lords of the manor, had their own pew erected. They even entered the church by a separate door, under which an interesting tomb can be seen. As the plaque explains, Francis Huntrods and his wife Mary led a life of extraordinary coincidences. Both born on the same day and the same year, this and many other coincidences continued throughout their lives. The building of Whitby Abbey by Lady Hilda started in 658, and in 664 the Synod of Whitby convened to establish the date for Easter. Occupying a site alongside the church, the youth hostel enjoys the same vistas. The story of a more infamous member of Whitby's history, Dracula, can be heard on the pier. Over this harbour, here in Whitby, much of the Dracula tale takes place here in Whitby. His ship was wrecked on the beach opposite, on Tate Hill Sands. And if that proves just too much, you can always console yourself with an ice cream. Whitby's historical ties with the sea can't be avoided no matter where you go. The Mission to Seamen is a charitable body, raising funds with bring and buy sales and providing refreshments to the town's residents and visitors.
I think this could be another satisfied customer. Steeped in history as it is, Whitby hasn't forgotten the children. Here on the top of the West Cliff is a pleasure park area with a paddling pool for the very young. And a variety of other fun rides to try. The town has a splendid indoor swimming pool with a main pool for the older children and swimmers and a small pool for the smaller non-swimmers to play in. But the jewel in Whitby's crown has to be its golden beaches. stretching from the Western Harbour Extension a full three miles all the way to Sands End. Perched on the edge of the cliff overlooking the beach is the Whitby Spa and Theatre. The theatre hosts a variety of performances from professional rep to local amateur productions. Five Divide is a very popular local band playing excellent 1960s music. During the filming of this program, Whitby held its annual folk festival, bringing many colourful and interesting characters into the town, one being Stuart, bass drummer of the Horrock Morris Men. Uh, we are the reigning world champions, and we won the medal in 1903, and there's never been a uh, world championship since, so we're still the reigning world champions. That's the prize medal. And uh, we're here for the full week and we'll be performing every single day, all over the place. Uh, our outfits come from Horwich, which was a famous place for making steam engines in the early days of trains and things. And our outfits come from the first class seating of the coaches that they made. Uh, because all the original members worked on the railway building thing. Uh, an intercity 125 was used to bring an estimated 500 plus visitors into Whitby Station for the folk festivities. To greet them on the platform was the town's crier, mayoress and the Whitby Jets. As the festival got underway, the town came alive with the sights and sounds of music and dancing. tranquil surroundings at Horska, the old railway station has been converted into a centre for mountain bike hire. The disused railway line that runs from Whitby to Scarborough is devoid of steep hills which makes it a perfect cycleway and footpath. And apart from the Whitby Scarborough Road, there are no major road crossings in its entire length, making it ideal for the family. The shorter and most popular route is to Robin Hood's Bay, a round trip of about six miles although the more adventurous can go on to Ravenscar, a further five miles. A novel idea is the trailer attached to the rear of a bike. It enables the smaller child to be taken on the ride with the rest of the family. Everyone's now ready and they're off. Next stop, Robin Hood's Bay. Cheerio. Have a nice day. <laughs> 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 
This is the view they'll experience when they arrive. Ravenscar, the next destination, is on the very end of the headland in the distance. With such steep and narrow roads down into the bay, vehicles have to be left in the car parks on the top of the hill. Leo Wormsley, author of Turn of the Tide, lived and worked in this house in Robin Hood's Bay. The track to Ravenscar skirts around the bay and comes out here. At the top of the track is a National Trust Centre with more detailed information on the area. But the pride of place in Ravenscar must go to Ravens Hall Hotel, perched on the very end of Ravenscar like a castle, with commanding views over the entire bay. Here, daughters can play croquet on the lawns. Non-residents are welcome and can take afternoon tea on the lawns and admire the award-winning gardens. The hotel boasts two swimming pools. The outdoor one is frequently opened to non-residents. It does, however, have one rather special attribute, as these visitors have discovered. At one end of the pool, there's a quite magnificent panoramic view of Robin Hood's Bay, stretching all the way to Ness Point. The cycle path has now become a popular means of getting to and from Robin Hood's Bay for the locals as well as visitors. Fifteen minutes down and forty minutes back. Because of the tunnel, a detour along the road has to be taken. But once picked up, the path will take you all the way to Scarborough, which is where these walkers have come from. Knowing that there are refreshments in the square just around the corner may have put an extra spring into their step. If cycling sounds a bit too energetic, why not try boating at Buzzup? With boats and canoes available, these quiet and tranquil waters will help you gently unwind. Or, just 300 yards down the road, is Doug Sims Railway. He not only laid the track himself, but built the steam locos as well. If, however, you feel these are a little too small for you, how about this one? The North Yorkshire Moors Railway runs from Gromont to Pickering through beautiful but very demanding countryside. 
Next stop, Gothland. Extensive filming of Heartbeat here in Gothland has led to a surge of visitors. But the shops continue to offer the same friendly welcome to visitors and locals that they always have. It has to be said, though, that the influx of visitors has helped the local traders and craftsmen. People like Julia Lewis here in the Prudham Gallery, who can now find a ready market for her pyrographic art. I like to get close to more work. Spend a lot of time on the North Yorkshire Moors taking photographs and studying each animal as I do it. Just to get the effect of the fur or feathers or whatever animal I'm doing. It's got to look right. I think you'd agree she produces some very fine work. Opposite Gothland's church is a small path leading down to Malian Spout, a rather pretty waterfall and well worth a visit. Although the walk down is quite steep, if you're in good health you should be okay. Once at the bottom the route is well marked, and even if you don't want to continue there's a stream for the children to play in. Do be a little careful though, the rocks can be a bit slippery in places. But if you can manage the extra 200 metres, the view of the waterfall is well worth the effort. If you want to paddle without the steps, try Darnholm. With relatively shallow water, it's yet another paradise for the children to play in. Another little nook in the immediate area is Blackhole, complete with village pub and bridge over the inevitable water. And of course, where there's water, yes, you'll find children playing in it. If you like waterfalls, Falling Foss should be on your list to visit. Close to Littlebeck, it can be reached by car or on the coast-to-coast -coast footpath. If you take the coast-to-coast -coast path to the right of the falls, approximately half a mile away is an old hermitage cut out of a solid boulder. Walkers find the moors a wonderful place to be, especially at this time of the year, with the heather in full bloom, carpeting the moors with a deep purple mantle. One of my favourite walks, especially early in the morning, is this path to Golden Grove. This building was originally a watermill and has now been converted to a private house with a waterfall and rock pools in the back garden and resident grey wagtails. Still within sight of the abbey is Sneeton and Beacon Farm. Beacon Farm is not just another barn converted into a tea room. Their real claim to fame is the award-winning ice creams they produce here on the farm. There's plenty to do in the evenings, 
ghost and Dracula walks. Some of the shops stay open well into the evening, creating an enchanting ambience of times gone by. For the young at heart, there's the weekly dance night at the spa, where the local group Five Divide performs songs of the 60s for both young and not so young. Entertainment and fun continue into the evening, the pier alive with people enjoying themselves. Whitby is one of two places in Britain where the sun rises and sets in the sea.